Hi there. Thank you for joining us and welcome to the Basics of Bugs. This week's edition is on viruses. Did I hear you say coronavirus? Well, we get to talk a little about coronavirus and so much more. We recall cell biology, we walk over central dogma, we get introduced to immunology and virology. But before I begin, I wanted to let you know that the subsequent lecture series will come up on Wednesday and Friday at 12 p.m. Central Time, and of course, made available to you on our YouTube channel should you want to rewatch or you're unable to join us at a stipulated time. My name is Shion Faladi Pupo. I'm a PhD student of entomology at Popon University. In the period of the lecture, should you have any question, please do not hesitate to ask using the chat box and our moderator will provide you with satisfactory answers. Now, let's get right into it. Uh, we start at the very beginning. What is a cell? A cell is the smallest unit of life. It is the foundational block on which all other biological premises are built upon. Basically, we have two types of cell, an eukaryotic cell and a prokaryotic cell. Very quickly, I want you to look at this and visualize what the major differences are between an eukaryotic cell and a prokaryotic one. Now, if your answer was the presence of a nucleus and membrane-bound organism, then you are absolutely correct. An eukaryotic cell has both a nucleus and membrane-bound organelles. In contrast, prokaryotic cells do not have membrane-bound organelles. So that means prokaryotic cells have organelles, just that their organelles lack a membrane-bound structure. Rather, their organelles are contained within the cytoplasm of the cell. Now, let's look at these cell types one after the other. A prokaryotic cell is the simplest form of cell you find out there. As such, it is much more idiosyncratic with unicellular organisms such as bacteria and archaea. Their chromosomes are mostly circular and binary fission is enough to satisfy the reproductive need of such cell. In contrast, eukaryotic cells are complex and as such very common around multicellular organisms. Nevertheless, you could have one or two unicellular organisms such as the protozoans, euglena, and paramecium that are eukaryotes. Eukaryotes contain membrane-bound organelles, which is what separates it from prokaryotes. The chromosomes are packed within the nucleus, and reproduction in eukaryotes is bare mitosis or meiosis. The organelles of a cell can be described as being analogous to the organs that we have inside humans. These organelles are bound by a lipid bilayer. The lipid bilayer is significant for each organelle to interact with the other or interact with other cells of the body. In fact, this lipid bilayer facilitates communication within adjacent cells or organelles and facilitates interaction with proteins. There are diverse organelles and um, we would go over one or two important ones. The first we would consider is the mitochondria. The mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. If you live in Alabama, think of the mitochondria as the Alabama power that supplies electrical energy to power your appliances in your homes. The difference is the mitochondria would supply ATP as energy to power the cell. The mitochondria has its own DNA and early scientists think because of the similarities with bacteria, chances are that mitochondria uh, break out from prokaryotes. There are two types of endoplasmic reticulum. You have the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, which acts as the storage organelle of the cell. So that means in the case where, or in cases where the cell needs to perform a particular function, let's say locomotion, it does not just start synthesizing calcium. What it does is it goes to the storage organelle, gets calcium, moves them to the muscle cells, and initiates locomotion. While the rough endoplasmic reticulum is involved in the synthesis and packaging of proteins. The nucleus acts like a brain of the cell. It controls eating, movement, and reproduction. The nucleus contains a particular material known as chromatin, which is made up of DNA, RNA, and nuclear proteins. Now we move to central dogma. The central dogma is the idea that explains to us the flow of genetic information from DNA down to polypeptides or proteins. 
The flow of genetic information from DNA to RNA is called transcription, while from RNA to polypeptide is known as translation. Now, let's go over each structure of these materials. The DNA is usually double-stranded helix. It contains the oxyribose sugar, and the polarity runs from the five prime end to the three prime end. In addition, the DNA contains nucleobases, adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. Adenine binds with thymine, while cytosine binds with guanine. In contrast, in RNA, what you have is not a double helical structure, rather you have a single helical structure as you have in this shape, and in this case, and it takes on the variable structures. These structures are determined by the ability of the basis. So that means the complementarity of the basis will determine what structure the RNA would form. For example, you could have an array form a pin, you could form a loop, you could form bodies, as I said, based on the complementarity of the nucleobases. In addition, the RNA contains a particular ribose sugar with two prime hydroxy group. This hydroxy group is why DNA is much more stable than RNA because the hydroxy group reacts with the phosphodiester bond of RNA and it clashes, making it unstable compared to DNA. One thing that separates DNA from RNA is the replacement of thymine with iridine. So when you see a set of nucleobases and you see CGAU, the catch here is that once you see U in such nucleobases, you should know that uh, that basis, that strand is an RNA. For protein, we have four structures of protein. You have the primary structure of protein, which is what you have in the string of amino acid joined together over here. You have the secondary structure that are maintained by hydrogen bonds. For example, they have five helix in this particular picture and the beta plates. The tertiary structure is the final three-dimensional chain of a single polypeptide chain. So when you have a single polypeptide chain, then it's called the tertiary structure. Now, when you have one or more or two tertiary structures of protein joined together, you get the quaternary structure of a protein. To begin the central dogma, it is important that genetic information is preserved. More importantly, because the DNA carries necessary information needed to perpetuate sequence, it needs to keep a copy of the sequences. So what the DNA does is, first it replicates itself. And how does it do this? Each parental strand would become templates for one strand, as you have in this picture, where you have the, temp the parental strand splitting to become templates for the daughter strand. In addition, this is called semi-conservative replication, where you have a parental strand, a parental strand splitting to become templates for the daughter strand. In DNA replication, replication follows a five prime to three prime direction. Now, let's go over quickly, very quickly, the process of DNA replication. For DNA replication to begin, you have the topoisomerase would have to remove this positive supercoiling nature of the DNA. Once this positive supercoil is removed, you have helicases comes into the fray to break or smash the bonds between the bases. Once the bonds are smashed, and the strands become single and isolated, as you have in this case, helicase recruits primase, which lays down a primer that the DNA polymerase would extend. The idea of the leading strand and lagging strand can be explained by paying attention to this one golden rule, which says the direction proceeds from five prime to three prime direction. So how do you determine a lagging strand from a leading strand? It's simple. Remember that with DNA replication, Replication follows five prime to three prime direction, and that is all you need to know to figure it out. Let's take, for example, these are the parental strands. So I will trace this all the way down to this portion. So this is the parental strand. DNA follows replication in five prime to three prime direction. So that means this daughter strand is being replicated in the five prime to three prime direction. Now, DNA strands are complementary. So that means if I have the five prime here, this becomes the three prime. So if I follow this strand all the way back to this point, this becomes the five prime, and this is the three prime. Going in the same direction, you follow it all the way, this becomes the five prime, and this is the three prime strand, the three strand. So how do you determine the leading strand from the lagging strand? The direction of replication in this particular strand goes this way, why for this? it proceeds in opposite direction. So 
to tell them apart, whenever replication proceeds towards the replication fork, which is somewhere around this area, in that direction, it is the leading strand. So the leading strand goes five prime to three prime direction in the position of the replication fork. Why the leading strand goes five prime to three prime direction away from the replication fork. And that is how you can identify a leading strand from a lagging strand. Once DNA is replicated, the next phase is transcription. In this case, you have DNA being converted to RNA. For transcription to begin, you only need one strand to get transcribed, which is the antisense strand. And the RNA polymerase would bind to the promoter on the antisense strands and the replication, the transcription follows five prime to three prime direction as you have in the case of DNA. One thing I would however say here is, either of the strand could be the antisense strand. It depends on the transcription factor on the promoter region. So the promoter would, the transcription factor on the promoter and the ability of the RNA polymerase to bind with either of the strand determines which becomes the antisense strand. As with, repl as with replication and transcription, it is also possible for you to have the conversion of DNA to RNA, and this is called reverse transcription. Reverse transcription is the mechanism that is commonly exploited by most viruses like retroviruses, where they pick an RNA template and make a DNA copy from the RNA template using a short primer. Let's review the case of a retrovirus. What a retrovirus does is it attaches itself to the host membrane via its spike proteins, Via endocytosis, it releases its nuclear material, genetic material into such cell, removes the code, and uses reverse transcriptase to transcribe the RNA into the DNA. Now, viruses are super smart. Once they go into or gain access into an host, what they do is they use or utilize the host machinery to work for themselves. They shut up, they shut down the host complex and they make sure that. All the host does is uses their own DNA to make RNA, and that's the case where you have DNA making mRNAs. The mRNAs become assembled, and the bond of the cells become new virions. The final process of central dogma is translation, where you have mRNA conversion to protein. Translation requires four primary components. You need the ribosomes, the mRNA, the tRNAs, and the amino acid tRNA synthesis. When you place an order for a particular item on Amazon, the order gets worked up on a particular office and a particular warehouse takes care of the order and ships the order to you. Now, before the item is shipped to you at the warehouse, it has to be packaged. And in the same case, the ribosomes in this case acts like the warehouse where everything gets packaged before protein is shipped to cells that require them. So the ribosomes is the site where translation occurs. Think of the ribosome like the warehouse where the particular item you order on Amazon gets packaged. The ribosome contains three sites. The amino acid site known as the A sites, the peptide site known as the P sites, and the E sites known as the H sites. mRNA is associated with only two of the sites, the A sites and the P sites. mRNA contains codons that are read, that are read in triplets, and the tRNA also contains anticodons that must be complementary to the mRNAs. The function of the amino acid tRNA synthesis in this particular mix is to drive specificity. What that means is, let's take for example, the mRNA contains a codon AUG. A, U, and G. So that means the tRNA must contain complementary set of codons too. So you have G pairing with C, A pairing with U, and A pairing with U. So that means for this tRNA to be attached to the mRNA, it has to have these complementary anticodons. Nevertheless, to insert methionine, amino acid tRNA synthesis drives specificity. So that means it is possible that what you have here is cysteine and not methionine, even though the anticodons would naturally incorporate methionine. But because the tRNA, the amino acid tRNA is telling the tRNA to insert cysteine, whenever you read methionine, it could change what is being incorporated eventually. So that means in the grand scheme of things, the amino acid tRNA synthesis would actually decide what particular protein becomes incorporated eventually. And this takes us to immunology. Immunology is the idea that explains how 
an organism utilizes cells such as the B cells, the T cells, to protect itself against invaders such as Joe and friends. We have two types of immune system. You have the plant immune system and the animal immune system. We'll would go over first the plant immune system. Plant pathogens utilize various strategies to gain access into plant body. For example, you have the palms, which is pathogen associated molecular patterns or microbial associated molecular patterns and bacterium. Sneak via lentil cells and stomata, which are openings on the plant cell to gain access into the cell. Now for nematode and aphids, these guys don't need to sneak. They are much more direct, the approach is much more direct, and they insert their stylets into the plant's body. For fungus, well, they've taken entry into a whole nother level. So what they do is they imaginate their feeding structure known as osterium into the plant's body. Now, when all of these pathogens gain access into a plant cell, what they do is they release certain things called virulence factors, known technically as effectors. Now, how does the plant respond to these invaders? The plant has two lines of defense. The first one can be likened or described as the city police, while the second one is the highway police. So you have the city police maintaining order or arresting invaders in this case within the city, while you have the highway patrol checking what is happening on the highway. So for the plant cell, the city police here had the pattern recognition receptor, the highway police rather, had the pattern recognition receptors that would go over the transmembrane looking for invaders to pick up. Why for the CC poly, you have police, you have the not like receptors also surveilling within the city to see where you have foreign invaders. Both defense mechanisms would recognize these effectors and they will trigger the PRR, would trigger PTI, which is palms triggered immunity. Why this is effector trigger immunity. Once these immunities are triggered, what happens next is the plants would suffocate. By suffocation, it means engulf. That's the technical term used via phagocytosis to digest or harass such invader. In humans, it's a little bit different. We have two lines of immunity. We have the innate immunity and the adaptive immunity. The innate immunity is similar to what was previously described, where you have both the city police and the highway police patrolling and looking for invaders to arrest. But uh, for the adaptive immunity, it is technically different. The adaptive immunity can be likened to FBI. What they do is, they don't just go arrest, go ahead and arrest. They surveil the profile of the criminal. They want to say, do, what do we know about this particular invader? How often does this invader invade? What is the history? Where is the invader from? So they are much more technical with their approach. They are much more sophisticated with their approach. And these examples are for the T and B cells. The B cells are super smart than the T cells because the T cells require antigen presenting cells to require or to recognize these invaders. In contrast, the B cells don't need to do that. They are so smart that they never forget the face. They have a photographic memory. So once they see a criminal, they never forget such criminal. And once the invader has been spotted, what the B cells does is they release antibodies that also go ahead to fight such invaders. So that means adaptive immunity in comparison to innate immunity is slower because they are methodological with their approach. They check the history. They want to know everything about the invader before they proceed with arrest. One thing that is of note here is that adaptive immunity is only idiosyncratic with vertebrates. That means invertebrates such as insects do not have adaptive immunity. And that's it, that about immunology. Now we move on to virology. So the number one question here is, are viruses living things? Personally, I do not think viruses are living things. They are his cellular structures for obvious reasons. But that is what I think. I would rather present you with some facts and let you reach a conclusion of your own. For an organism to be treated as living, it has to have a cellular structure. Viruses do not have a cellular structure. In fact, they lack membrane-bound organelles or even naked organelles. Also, 
Viruses rely on living hosts to replicate. If you have to be classified as a living organism, you must have the ability to replicate independently. Viruses cannot do that. They are small in size, range about 20 to 400 nanometer, and what the virus has in common is just a protein coat and one nucleic acid core. And in this case, it is either a DNA or a RNA. So, where do viruses come from? To explain where viruses come from, we have two hypotheses that tend to give us the clue where viruses come from. One is the cellular origin hypothesis and the other is the regressive hypothesis. The cellular origin hypothesis argues that viruses are genetic offshoots of their host. In this case, they think viruses are mobile genetic elements such as plasmid and transposons that broke off from the host and miraculously found a way to stay independent. The regressive hypothesis goes in another direction. It is a direction that is opposite to the cellular hypothesis. Yeah, scientists think, well, they're not that smart, they're not that cool. Rather, what you have with viruses is that they are just remnants from more complex cellular organisms that just found a way to stay alive. So how do we deal with the morphology of viruses? Because viruses have diverse morphologies, it is really difficult to put the lead on the shape. Nevertheless, one thing is idiosyncratic to all viruses. They contain one nucleic acid that is protected by capsid. So based on the shape of the capsid, it has become much more convenient to explain viruses by the shape of their capsids. And in this case, you could have helical viruses where you have in the case of tobacco mosaic virus, you have the icosahedra one in the case of rhinoviruses, and there are some cases that you don't even know what to call the shape. You just call them complex, as you have in the case of variola virus. So how do we classify viruses? We classify viruses based on their genome structure or their genome shape. Based on genome structure, it is possible to have a double or single-stranded DNA, a double-stranded RNA, a single-stranded RNA that is in the positive or negative sense, and retroviruses. One thing I would, however, say here is that the genomic structure has implication for what the virus will do upon gaining entrance into an host. For example, if the virus were to be double-stranded DNA, what the virus would do is, because it is double-stranded, it picks one copy of the strand to make mRNA, from mRNA to make proteins. If it's a single-stranded DNA, what it does is, it wants to preserve the genetic information, so it synthesizes another copy of the DNA before going on to pick one of the strands to make mRNA. If it's a double-stranded RNA, well, what it does is, it picks one of the strands to make proteins. Now, if it is a single-stranded RNA in the positive sense, as you have in the case of coronavirus, what it does is, upon entrance into the host, the next thing it does is, it starts making protein because the RNA is in the positive sense. Now, if it's a single-stranded negative sense, what happens is, you have the negative sense making another copy of RNA before the RNA progression into protein. Based on genomic shape, it is possible also to classify viruses as linear, circular, or segmented. And that takes us to the last portion of the class, which is coronavirus. Coronavirus is known as severe acute respiratory syndrome. And very quickly, I would go over the mechanism detailing how a particular, how coronavirus gained entrance into the host body. Coronavirus is a single-stranded RNA in the positive sense, which means upon entrance into the host cell, it starts making protein. But how does it gain its entrance into the host cell? What happens is the coronavirus have spike proteins surrounding this nucleic the genome, and the spike proteins attaches itself to a particular protein on the cell membrane of its host known as ACE2. Weirdly, a particular protein known as TMPRSS2 facilitates the entry of this single-stranded positive sense into the host cell. So scientists think if there's a particular protease on the host membrane facilitating the entrance of coronavirus into us, one way to prevent entry of coronavirus might be to find a way to turn off this particular protein. And as such, today, some scientists are working around the clock to find vaccines that could inhibit this particular protease and discontinue the entry of coronavirus in us. Now, 
what happens when coronavirus, when the RNA gets entrance into the host membrane? Well, upon entrance, because the RNA is in the positive sense, it starts making proteins. Now, do you remember the B cells, the super smart guys that have photographic memories? Well, they produce antibodies upon the recognition of the single sense RNA of coronavirus. Once this, these antibodies are so massively produced that it becomes a problem for us. How does it become a problem for us? These antibodies are rich in cytokines. Unfortunately for us, there is a certain level of cytokines that we can tolerate. When these antibodies are massively produced by B cells, so that means we have a cytokine storm, we have too much cytokines in us, and this triggers the symptoms that are experienced by patients who suffer from coronavirus, which is fever, fatigue, difficulty in breathing. And this is why it is important for you that whenever you have to go outdoor, make sure you put on your nose mask, wash your hands regularly, and when you do wash your hands, wash your hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds, as recommended by WHO. And this brings us to the end of the class. I would like to thank our lesson developer, Luis Mendez, our moderators, Luis Chelsea and Hotom, the FSR and Entomology and Plant Pathology Club, and the Department of Entomology and Plant Pathology, Open University. Thank you very much.